surgeons keep our hearts beating. They do the amazing, help save lives, and so can you. Your CSL Plasma donation can help create 24 critical life-saving medicines that can give Grandpa the chance for his heart to swell when he meets his new grandson or give a bride the chance for her heart to skip a beat on her wedding day. Every plasma donation helps more than you know. Do the amazing. Help save lives. Donate today at your local CSL Plasma Center and be rewarded for your generosity. The Neverland Podcast, episode 28. Welcome to Neverland. Take a start of the right and stay until morning. Neverland. Good morning, Neverland! All right, Neverlanders, it is I, once again, your host, Jeremy, inviting you to grab that pixie out of your pocket and give her a little shake so you can fly with me to Neverland. And I tell you, there is a, a lot of things to go over this this week. Uh, we had E3 going on this week, and so there's a lot of stuff going on in video game news, and of course, things coming around from, the, from uh, like... Uh, comic book movies and things like that. Just a lot of different things, so I'm going to really have to skim the surface. Uh, th- it's been kind of an exciting time trying to get this podcast together. Uh, I have a guest that uh, I have planned on that uh, I recorded a conversation with her. Uh, well, I thought I was recording it over Skype, and my program that I was using to that I've recorded previous shows on failed me completely and after like an hour and a half conversation of really good content i found out that the file had nothing in it uh so and i have as of yet not recorded uh the second attempt at that conversation but uh, hopefully by the end of this episode you're going to hear a new recording that i'm going to have to make i did find a new program and uh our guest this week is has been i think probably very patient with me with i'm panicking like oh no i lost everything um but we're just going to go right on with it because I've got a lot of fun stuff to really to share because of E3 this week. Uh, and also, I have a movie review for you this week of How to Train Your Dragon 2. So, without me goofing around here too much, let's just get straight to it. We've really got to work on your solo gliding there, buddy. Toothless! <laughs> You're pouting, big baby boo! <laughs> Well, try this on! Yeah. Oh, you feeling it yet? Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't hurt a one-legged. Ah! Oh. <laughs> this is Burke. Life here is amazing. Dragons used to be a bit of a problem. <laughs> but now they've all moved in. Did I tell you that you look amazing today? Because you do. Ugh. And with Vikings on the backs of dragons, the world just got a whole lot bigger. This is amazing! What happened here? What could have done this? I bet you think you know a lot about dragons. Let me show you some of what you don't know. Can I know you? No. You were only a babe. But a mother never forgets. Unbelievable. You've been rescuing them. Something is coming. Something you've never faced before. The dragons are mine now. Protect our people. It's your destiny. What you're searching for, it's in here. Come on! This is very dangerous! Are you kidding me? Come on, Toothless! Dragons and Vikings! Enemies again! Oh. You 
no, that doesn't wash out. All right, so back in 2010 is when the original How to Train Your Dragon come out, and I saw that one in the theater, just loved it. It's based off of a book series, which I should probably read, because I really had a lot of fun with it. Uh, it was very much kind of a funny film, uh, but now when you compare it to How to Train Your Dragon 2, uh, DreamWorks kind of really seems to have been put Disney and Pixar on notice in, in quality of the, the graphics and the imagery. I mean, granted, the characters still do look, have that same kind of cartoony look that they had from the first one. You know, they look, you know, they don't look the, the, the normal proportions of a regular person, but they, they have believable proportions nonetheless. But the uh, skin tone uh, is much more realistic. I mean, you can kind of make, you know, make out freckles on their skin and everything. I mean, just looks fantastic. Uh, you know, the same amount of detail you expected out of Disney, like with Frozen or with Pixar, but what they did with Monsters University and the detail in the fur. Uh, DreamWorks is just right on par. And as far as story goes, my goodness, this, uh, they really pull you in on this one. And uh, I, I want to be careful. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but you heard from the trailer that, you know, Hiccup, who the character we follow from before, you know, he's had great success with, um, integrating the the dragons into the vikings and there's a lot more dragons in this and the dragons are show a lot more personality uh they're because they're all you know they was established in the first film that they were all kind of different and had different kind of abilities and stuff like that uh and each you know of the major characters uh, kind of bonded with like certain dragons but the the dragons personalities really come out because there was a lot more dragons and a lot more fun uh, with what they did, and even in certain scenes where you're kind of paying attention to the story going on in the foreground, but in the background there might be a couple of dragons that are doing something funny behind them. So it's really worth actually viewing the film a second time just to watch all the fun things that are happening with, with the dragons in the background uh, and their little personalities, and they're just just a hoot. Uh, I predict they're going to be selling a lot of these little uh, plush dragons that uh, we found at Walmart and everything. We've picked up a toothless uh this afternoon after we saw the movie because we really really did enjoy this it was a lot of fun uh with all the you know it was very funny and fun to watch the dragons doing their thing and a, really a great kind of a adventure story and also uh you get to hear that you know we get introduced to hiccup's mother uh and uh i don't want to give away really a whole lot of stuff but she is this this other legendary dragon writer kind of well not necessarily legendary but you know they find out about the, a villain they find out about this other dragon rider they find out there's people who will go around hunting and trapping dragons for uh, this villain uh the guy who's trapping them is a character called uh Eret, son of Eret, voiced by kit harrington uh really kind of an interesting character you know he, he's kind of the uh, one of the bad guys uh, when you first meet him but you kind of suspect that that might turn around by the end you know but he's he's very just a, a fun character and you will like that character uh, uh, throughout the film and everything, and I think he might be, if they do a, How to Train Your Dragon 3, I think he might be back. Um, but, you know, they also, the, so they find out about this villain, Drago, who is apparently getting an army of dragons together, and I guess he gave the Vikings some trouble back before Hiccup's time, you know, and, uh, you know, he, he said that he could make, you know, control of the dragons, and there's a lot of themes of being a master over dragons and being the alpha of dragons, which, you know, it's it's very much like in nature. You have the alpha male or whatever, because, you know, there was a kind of the establishment of where there were queens of a nest in, of dragons in the first one, but there's the alpha who is able to almost hypnotically control all these dragons. And, and uh, it doesn't really explain how dragon became such a dragon, ma or how Drago became such a dragon master that he has exhibits such control over the dragons that he has had captured and has made this army to where he's now going to become a threat to Burke. Uh, Burke, of course, remember being the the kingdom or village or whatever where Hiccup uh, lives and his father, uh, Stoic, is the chief. Um, but all the characters are back. Uh, Kate Blanchett is, is new. Uh, she's Volca. That's Hiccup's mother. Uh, Hiccup, of course, being voiced by Jay Baruchel from the first one. Uh, I don't know if I said his name right, uh, but uh, he was also in Sorcerer's Apprentice, a few other things. Gerard Butler is returning as Stoic. Uh, 
But boy, they really they did a lot more stuff with Stoic. It's really kind of fun to see his character, and you really start to kind of like his character, and it, it sets you up for the emotional attachments and twists and turns that are are really going to pull you into this movie. It's a really great story. Lots of good. You know, it, had, it had lots of heart and a lot of good family kind of things where things are like you know there's there's definitely a point in the movie where you're thinking wow everything's really looking up here. This is going to be great before like the dark chapter of things happen. And this movie, well, its dark chapter gets really dark and it will suck you in i was worried it, it kind of happened late in the movie i was worried that maybe we're going to have an empire strikes back type of ending there for a long time and i did see a, a couple people get up and leave the theater thinking maybe we were, we'd come to an ending because it seemed like everything was just over it's that it's that dark of a, a spot where it just seems like oh well this is just over and i guess it'll take a third movie to fix everything that's wrong now but no it does actually resolve within the same movie there's this a, a great turnaround and a, a good lesson is learned and it had a little bit of a lion king quality because uh well, Hiccup has really proved himself to his father, and he's really wanting to pass the, the reins of being a chief. And so there's lessons to be learned of what does it mean to be the alpha and be the chief, and what does that mean, and how do you do that? Uh, which I don't want to get into because I don't want to spoil anything, but I definitely recommend this movie. We had loads of fun. Uh, the dragons are funny and cute in their own goofy ways, uh, and you'll probably want to go and buy you know, some toys afterwards. <laughs> and the toys are really neat. We did look at a lot of them. There's some really great stuff. There's even a little thing of Toothless that uh, uh, you squeeze him and he growls on different kind of growls. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, definitely you got to go see this one, and I hope they make a third one uh, because I've really been enjoying these. I've only seen a little bit of the uh, the television series but uh, you don't have to have seen much of the television series to be able to pick straight up again because uh, this is supposed to be five years later and uh, Hiccup has invented a lot of new things uh, really good yeah that's all I can say about it is you definitely need to go see this movie if you liked the first one because it really took it up a notch and uh, this was a lot better than Frozen and I know Frozen was like Disney's big cash cow right now but uh i think this really put frozen on notice because i think a lot more people will enjoy this c-3po loki mace windu dr bruce banner captain rex venom princess leia gene gray Darth Maul. Nick Fury. Grand Moff Tarkin. Captain America. Lando Calrissian. Cyclops. What do all these characters have in common? Well, two of them were played by Samuel L. Jackson. A couple of them were played by Hammer Films veterans Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Come on, guys. You know this. Well, of course we do, Jessica. Just like Mickey Mouse and Captain Jack Sparrow, they're all now Disney characters. Hello, I'm Tracy of the Disney Indiana Podcast, and my co-host Scott and I enjoy talking about all aspects of the House of Mouse, and that includes their newest properties, Marvel and LucasArts. We also talk about Disney resorts, the cruise line, theme parks, and whatever else Mickey has to offer. Which includes movies, Imagineering, video games, and collectibles. You'll never know what we'll decide to talk about. So check us out at www.disneyindiana.com or do a search for the Disney Indiana podcast on iTunes because now we've got a lot more to talk about. And don't forget about those other quote-unquote Disney characters like, well, Sully, Fozzie Bear, Buzz Lightyear, Link Hogthrob, Doug, Janice, Merida, Pepe, Bruce, Ralph the Dog, Wally, Dr. The Disney Bunsen Indiana Hindu, Podcast. Syndrome, Even after Bella. five years, we're still miles away from the nearest Main Street, USA. We're not listed on the map, but you can join us at www.disneyindiana.com. Okay, now I did say that it was kind of a, a big week for a lot of different happenings. Uh, and I just want to touch base on a few things because, you know, E3 did happen this week. Some of the things that uh, was kind of either announced or, you know, given further announcements is uh, like Battlefront 3, Star Wars Battlefront 3. Uh, there was some talk about that uh, and how they're actually trying to go back to the classic trilogy and try to get more of a capture that look. And that is 
hopefully coming out soon. I think it's going to mainly be focused on uh, the the newer systems like the PS4 and Xbox One. Uh, I don't know any other details. Like I said, I'm just going to skim things because there's so many things. Uh, a, a lot more details revealed this week also for Disney Infinity 2. Uh, we got to see an entire playset for Spider-Man. Now, it seems this is based kind of around the Ultimate Spider-Man animated series that has been on Disney XD. Um, and because, you know, you, you've got the part of the, it looks like initially if you get the playset, you'll get a Spider-Man and Nova. Uh, other figures in the set is included Nick Fury, uh, Venom, uh, and uh, Iron Fist. Is that everybody? I think so. <laughs> it's been a while since I looked at the pictures and everything. Uh, but uh, you get to battle villains like the ultimate version of Green Goblin. And apparently what the storyline is here is that uh, Norman Osborn, an ultimate Green Goblin, has tried to clone the symbiote from Venom and has now unleashed these alien symbiotes upon the citizens of New York and it's up to Spider-Man and his friends to save everybody which sounds very close to the plot of Spider-Man Web of Shadows anybody play that video game where the symbiotes were running wild and taking over everyone and so it's pretty similar to that uh, I'm excited though that there's going to be at least a Spider-Man set I personally would have liked to have more of a classic Spider-Man set and if you were going to give him some friends how about Iceman and Firestar you know his old amazing friends but uh, still I'm, I'm excited about this it's more Marvel characters coming up um also we've gotten to see that there is a maleficent figure which is unfortunately movie version and not classic uh animated version uh, a lot of good characters coming out i'm very excited for this it's going to be released on all systems when it comes out um also seen something about uh lego batman 3 beyond gotham which is going to be i guess a little prettier a little trickier uh doing some odd things here in the batman universe i didn't get to play the uh, Batman 2 one yet, but I didn't like that uh, everybody started talking. It kind of took away from some of the fun of the Lego games where everybody just, ur, ur, you know, uh, when they started having complete sentences, you're kind of like, oh, well, that's still cool, but uh, it's, it, it seemed to lose some of the humor because they could talk. Uh, and apparently Batman Arkham Knight is a huge step forward, uh, really, in the franchise and everything. And Because uh, people you know, thought Batman Arkham Origins was kind of meh. I enjoyed it. But everybody's really excited, apparently, for the new Arkham Knight. Um, well, those are the main ones I can think of. But as far as things going on in, uh, in movies and things like that, uh, I'm sure you've probably heard about Harrison Ford being uh, injured by some sort of hydraulics or something in a door uh, on board the Millennium Falcon set and everything. Uh, he is recovering, and they are continuing to film. Uh, other fun things in, in movie news, I found out... Uh, okay, so Game of Thrones' Byron Cogman... Uh, is going to write the Magic the Gathering movie. I did not realize this was happening, uh, but uh, I, I don't know no much about this writer. I'm figuring he's mainly written probably a few episodes, if not many episodes, for the television show. But, yeah, you know, I I would if they do a good job with this movie, I, I would probably go see it. I used to play that back in high school, way back in the day, and apparently it's still going strong. Uh, something else interesting... Um, there's a possibility that Crossbones is, they say, returning for Captain America 3. And here's the thing is, okay, so Frank Grillo was playing Brock Rumlow, who was Crossbones. Now, I I don't know if I caught that he was there. I, I, I'm I not, you know, big on a lot of knowing a lot of things on Captain America, unfortunately. I, you know, I don't read a whole lot of his stuff. I have read... Um, some of the more recent type of things, but uh, I don't know if maybe he was part of the group of guys on the boat. I don't really want to spoil anything for the movie, and so I, I'm not going to get too far in that. But I guess there's a possibility that Crossbones will be coming back around. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, other interesting kind of things. Uh, Jason Momoa uh, is apparently going to be Aquaman in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Uh, this so far is kind of rumored, and I guess he's he's well known for being in Game of Thrones. Uh, could be very interesting. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. I think we already mentioned that the, a movie is on the way, but uh, it's uh, there was a bit more information given at the E3. Unfortunately, I wasn't at E3 to get a whole bunch of information about that. Um, there is also something interesting: Wonder Woman, Shazam, and Green Lantern, and Flash. Uh, there's some team up projects that are becoming rumors now take that as it is it is a rumor this this could happen could not happen i'm sure plenty of people will be very excited about that but yeah, we don't know exactly if it's really going to happen 
there apparently though I didn't know anything about this, but uh, uh, Michael Keaton uh, apparently has some sort of an appearance in a Birdman trailer. Uh, now, many of you might not know exactly who Birdman was. Now, there was a, a Hanna-Barbera cartoon called Birdman, and uh, I think the first plot in time most people hear about it is, um, oh, they had, like, what, Harvey Birdman on uh, Adult Swim, where they had him as a lawyer. But, uh, and it's alternately titled The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, but apparently Birdman is going to be a movie. It tells the story of an actor, which being played by Michael Keaton, famous for portraying an iconic superhero, which is funny because he was Batman, as he struggles to mount a Broadway play. In days leading up to opening night, he battles his ego and attempts to recover his family and his career and himself. Um, so... I, I don't know if it's... I mean, because uh, there's a picture I've seen where it has, like, kind of a Michael Keaton and it has someone who kind of looks like the old bird man. So I don't know if it's actually linked to the old show. And, you know, uh, I don't know how many people would actually remember it anyway. So who knows? Um, but also E3, uh, Rise of Tomb Raider. Uh, apparently, uh, we need a, it's going to be a reboot. And I guess, uh, I think the last Tomb Raider game was actually supposed to be going back to Lara Croft's initial, um, crash landing or whatever has happened to where she became Lara Croft, the, uh, the adventurer type of person instead of just spoiled rich girl. Uh, I didn't actually play that. Uh, I'm not really a big Tomb Raider fan. And is that weird? But, uh, yeah, I, I just couldn't get into the game mechanics of it and I'd always just get, uh, frustrated with it. Uh, but Marvel announced that uh, the Demolisher returns this October. Deathlock number one. Uh, looks like we got a creative team of Nathan Edmondson and Mike Perkins, who, you know, they've previously worked on Black Widow, The Punisher, and Captain America, and things like that. Um, and I figure this might have something to do with the fact that Deathlock is now, you know, back in the public eye, thanks to the Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, television series, which started really picking up steam, especially when they had Deathlock in there. Uh, but uh, apparently another Star Wars film confirmed for a London production. I'm just kind of skimming through a lot of different news things, so if I sound a little unorganized compared to normal, that's because there was just so much stuff, and I'm just trying to get it all out there. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be, of course, a London production here. Um, but they did not make another announcement that they're going to be, of course, filming around in that area, which really isn't that surprising. Um, but it looks like some of the spinoffs are going to be filmed around in London as well, which, you know, I think most of the other films have been filmed, you know, a lot of their uh, special effects were filmed over around in England as well. Uh, oh, here's something cool. Marvel's Daredevil uh, found a kingpin. Uh, of course, now you know there was going to be a, a Netflix series of Daredevil. Uh, and, of course, Charlie Cox has been announced to play the title role of Daredevil, but also now it's been revealed that Vincent D'Onofrio is going to be playing the kingpin, Wilson Fisk. Uh, other big news that happened this week, uh, this was actually happened on Friday. Uh, the WWE actually released about, like, ten different uh, people, including Teddy Long, who he wasn't really a wrestler uh, at this point, but uh, Jinder Mahal, Brodus Clay, Oksana, which I'm kind of sad to see her go. She was actually one of the few women I thought actually had some good wrestling talent. Uh, Evan Bourne, who I thought was already had been released, but he's officially gone now. Yoshitatsu, uh, a lot of guys that really just, I don't think they gave much of a chance. These are some really good wrestlers. Drew McIntyre, uh, just guys that really just didn't seem to be going anywhere. And I don't know if maybe they just weren't given the right opportunities or they just didn't take, an, an oppor take advantage of the opportunities they had. But a whole lot of people, uh, although I feel bad for like Brodus Clay, who they let him go. He was doing pretty well, but they took his gimmick away from him. He was coming out, he was the Funkasaurus, and he'd come out dancing, and he had his two Funkadactyls, these two girls, uh, which one of these two girls was actually previously on the last Tough Enough as the first person who got eliminated because she she wasn't really a good wrestling fan. But now she's getting to keep her job, and she has been somewhat learning to wrestle and trying to be in competition. Uh, and she gets to stick around and have the old Brodus Clay theme music while Brodus Clay is hit the bricks. Uh, just doesn't seem right to me. But uh, that's the news, all the news that is the news, and that's the news for the news and the news. So, all right, we'll just move right along into our next content. 
All right, Neverlanders, we have our first real celebrity guest that isn't just another podcaster. I have somebody on here who has actually been in at least one movie, a lot of TV and things like that. But if you ever saw her on the street, you wouldn't recognize her face. You wouldn't know her from the next person over. But if you heard her talking, you stopped and said hello, you'd probably hear this voice. Hello! And you'd say, oh my gosh, <laughs> who, how do I know you? And it's Katie Lee! Hi, hi, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on the show. Yay, and thanks for being on. This is awesome. I'm, I'm going to try not to like geek out here because you've got a long history of doing a lot of voices that, and, and your website is even uh, labeled as the voice of your childhood because you literally are the voice of our childhood. Well, thank you. Yeah, I only got that idea. I don't want to sound all arrogant, but so many people have come up and said that to me. My husband was very clever and said, why don't you just make that the name of your website? And I said, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. There's not that many people who could really make that claim because you did so much work on so many different projects that Yeah. Yeah, I I when I you don't really know what you're doing until you get my age and look back and see it and you, to appreciate is pretty uh, amazing. I've had such a great a lot of great opportunities in my life uh to work on some great sh memorable shows that meant a lot to people, especially uh, without saying your age, I'll just say in your age range. <laughs> uh, but what do you mean? I mean at your age because you're only like 15. I swear your voice doesn't sound <laughs> any older than that. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, But oh my goodness. So let's just kind of back up to the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. Uh, so what got you into doing uh, the, the voice acting? Were you looking to do regular acting like stage or anything like that at first? Or No, actually um, when I was – I didn't know there was anything unusual about my voice until I guess I became 18 and older and then people started commenting on it. And um, I met somebody on college break who had suggested voiceover and introduced me to somebody. And I thought, well, that might be a great way to earn a little extra money. That's how most people think in the beginning. And um, so I, I was living in San Francisco. And in the meantime... Um, not really pursuing that, but kind of up there back in those days in the early 80s, you could get an agent. Oh, I, I got, I made a demo, got an agent, but also prior to that, I had just taken an improv class. Which for, is um, <laughs> it, Yeah, I just thought it would help me be more confident and get out of my shell. And I took the first class and they moved to the next level. They moved to the next level and ended up on stage. But that's basically the extent pretty much of my acting training, which it turns out is the kind of acting that's almost always not, if not required, beneficial for voice actors. So that happened coincidentally. And I thought I wanted to be a producer. Um, but when I graduated college, I had gotten into the Screen Actors Guild by doing my little bits of voice work. And uh, people said, well, your voice is more geared towards animation. So why don't you move to L.A., which, where it's all happening? And so I gave myself a couple years. I figured, well, I'll try this. I'm out of college. I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, within two years, I was able to do voiceover full time. So I guess it was a good decision. <laughs> yeah, you've been doing at it for what? How many years now? Oh well, since '81 or before. So my goodness, uh, you can do the math. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't <laughs> major in math. I majored in in communication. So <laughs> you do the math. But yeah, no, it's it's um. Just a wonderful surprise, and I'm very thankful that that I got to to do it. And I really I learned on the job watching other. I've worked with. I'm, I came in at a time when all the great great stars were still working. Uh, a lot of them have passed away, and I got to work with them and watch them. So I, I came in at a really good time. Yeah, I mean, you've gotten to work with Hal Smith, mm -hmm. uh, who was on uh, Andy Griffith as. Uh, Otis was he? I can't yep, remember the name. Yep. yep, Otis the drunk, and then. But he also was in Davy and Goliath. Do you know he was uh, Goliath? Oh my gosh, that was him. Uh huh. I, so I grew up him. listening to him when I was a kid. Wow, and then of course he's known as being Owl from the Winnie the Pooh uh, original. And even 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 in the uh, the uh, television animated series, he was still alive. I think doing Owl for those as well, wasn't he? Oh so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he'd be a very recognizable voice. So very, very much so. Yeah, he's he's been around a long, long time. Yeah, we even did the little prince together now that I think about it, and that was 
I, that might have been before or during Dumbo Circus. I don't know. Which, speaking of Dumbo Circus, that's probably one of the major ones that people my age are going to remember your voice from, as you are the only voice for Dumbo. That's our show for today, boys and girls. I hope you liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was great, too. I went to audition for the cat, and they said, wait a minute, because I don't know what they had in mind for Dumbo. They go, we want you to read for Dumbo now, and I and that's how I got that. So that's when you went not back in the day when you actually were face-to-face with people when you were auditioning so they could play around with you. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. The only voice that Dumbo probably will ever have is mine. Which is awesome, which is uh if if somebody has connections in with D23, because they're usually – it's through them that they do like the, the Disney Legends thing that they started where they actually start you know, giving the official honor of you are a Disney legend. I think that qualifies you already. Well, I hope so. Uh, we'll just see. I don't know who's in charge of that, but if they contact me, I would have no problem joining their ranks. Yeah, hopefully maybe somebody is listening to me like, hey. Yeah, I hope so. The only voice for Dumbo. So, And that was back when the Disney Channel was awesome because they had all the – they were used to show the actual classic Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck cartoons. And you had Dumbo Circus and Welcome to Pooh Corner and they'd show the old classic Disney movies. Oh, it was a great channel back then. Yeah, it was. Yeah, a lot – like, yeah, the old movies. It was fun. It was uh, great. I don't know why they don't put some of that stuff on their now free channels. I don't, I don't know because I think they're trying to appeal to the Nickelodeon teenage market and all the shows that they have now. I guess teenagers still watch them, but I'm like, yeah, this used to be something fun that your parents wouldn't mind watching with you. But all I hear from my parent friends now is like, oh, look, my kids want to watch Jesse now. Yay. Well, maybe if uh, if someone's listening, they'll put the old stuff on so parents can enjoy watching that with their kids. Yeah, bring back the Toon Disney Channel or Vault Disney where we used to show a lot of shows actually that you were on that used to show, which we'll get to uh, those. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll I'll let you, I'll let you lead the way. Are, yeah, we'll work our way up to some stuff that people who might be more familiar with the Disney Afternoon are going to know another voice. But uh, the like next thing, we'll go up the list. We'll hop ahead because uh, – See, I, I can't remember if we found out that the Smurfs thing was kind of a boo-boo when we looked at this before. Oh, where is that? Yeah. But we'll it has you listed as Prince we're, Dax we're, or look, we're looking at uh, IMDb, and actually I have mine open in edit. <laughs> I, don't <know> how, <laughs> I, I don't know how to edit it, though. I got it open, but I don't know how it's going to let me do this. I was in the Smurfs, but I played Denisa, who was Gargamel's niece. So yeah. Paul, Paul Winchell's niece, her little br- his bratty niece. Paul Winchell was Gargamel? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's not the only time you work with Paul Winchell because if we hop up ahead to uh, the Gummy Bears. Yes. You had Paul Winchell in there was uh, Zummy Gummy, and then you were Sunny Gummy. I played Sunny Gummy. Ta-da! How do I look? <laughs> <laughs> Which was one of my favorite shows when I was younger. I loved the Gummy Bears. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You, you had a lot of great familiar voices because even uh, what is uh, Alonzo Music? I always get the first name wrong. Lorenzo Music. Lorenzo Music. There, Bill for Scott, Rocky, mm-hmm. Rocky and Bullwinkle fame. Yeah. Uh, he was Bullwinkle, and June Foray, who played Rocky, was also she played Grammy Gummy. Yes. And uh, Paul Winchell from Winchell Mahoney and Tigger. Uh, he was on the show. And Will Ryan also worked on the Gummy Bears. Rob Paulson came on and played one of the Gummy Bears. After yeah, Rob Paulson, was he, I, he, was he Gusto? The artist Gusto, guy? yes. yes. And the then later went on to be on Ninja Turtles and things like that as Raphael. And, yeah. And now yeah. he's currently Donatello and, of the and Ninja Turtles. one Turtle. of my favorite shows, which is uh, Pinky and the Brain. Oh, he was on Pinky and the Brain, too? Yeah, he was Pinky. Oh, that is awesome. Yep. I probably knew that and forgot, but that is really cool. So you've gotten to work with so many cool people. Do you like network in with all these people and everybody kind of is like, when they find a part on something they're working on say, hey, I know the perfect voice for that. And you guys like call each you other. You know, every once in a while it might work that way. Um, maybe more nowadays. But, you know, back then we all just auditioned and we're all happy to see each other at work. So um, every once in a while, someone might make a suggestion, but especially when you were doing network stuff, there's so many people involved in casting. It's just uh, there was just a small pool of talent back then, smaller pool. So we would just bump into each other either at auditions or usually the auditions are the people who have similar voices. So that's why it was so much fun to do My Little Pony because all of us girls who used to 
sort of compete for the same roles, although we all love each other, got to actually work together on that show. So that was wonderful. And you have a long list of ponies that you were the voice for. <laughs> yeah, more than I can recount. But uh, <laughs> but everybody did that. Everyone, every time Hasbro came up with a new pony, type of pony, they had to create uh, a visual for it and a voice. So we were all challenged on that show to do as many different voices as we could. <laughs> So it's like, here's what this pony looks like. Now come up with a different voice, and it has to sound different from the voice you have from five other ponies. Thanks. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And we'd say, you know, we'd have to listen. What did we do the last time? Because <laughs> uh, we couldn't remember. Couldn't remember. Oh, goodness. So, anyway. And then also kind of a rare cartoon that I know uh, they recently finally did release these on DVDs. Gummy Bears needs to have more than one season of Gummy Bears out. But Dungeons & Dragons, I think they've released the entire series now, and you were Sheila the Thief. Yeah, they uh, 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 an independent company put them together and actually had us go into the studio. Well, I did it. I uh, think it was the only original cast member. Uh, there was a script that was never recorded, and the fans, there's still websites, Dungeons & Dragons fans, who are still out there writing scripts for the show. Wow. Um, and But there was one script that was written that was never recorded, and so the guy who put together this box set had uh, some actors record the last script, and you can see the script on the screen, but you, it was never animated. And I actually had my daughter come in and read the part of Diana. <laughs> Because <laughs> they needed somebody to read her role. Um, uh, so th- anyway, that was interesting. But when we did that show, that was had a, well, the same director did Dungeons and Dragons, who also directed Muppet Babies. And he was very creative when it came to casting. So you'll notice in, in Dungeons and Dragons, we had Donnie Most from Happy Days. We had Willie Ames and Adam Rich on there from uh, Eight is Enough. Wow. So, you know Bible Man. <laughs> I know Bible Man before he was Bible Man. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I used to pray for him before he was Bible Man. So <laughs> I, I like to think that somehow my prayers uh, helped uh, get him Bible Man status. So. Yeah. He actually doesn't live too far from where I'm at. I believe he still lives in Overland Park, Kansas, and I'm over here in Kansas City. So oh. if I knew where he lives, I'd go visit and say, you're Willie Ames. I remember you because Buddy Limbeck. I loved Buddy Limbeck. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I don't know where uh, he lives, actually. You know, now that we have Facebook, we're all finding each other again. But <laughs> for the longest time, when cell phones came out, you know, we all changed our numbers. And it, and we don't, and then we stopped auditioning the way we used to. So we don't – we just kind of – it's real interesting, the whole voiceover world, how it's sort of evolved. But, you know, we used to see each other all the time. And a lot of times now we record separately and we just don't see each other as much as we used to. And, and obviously the communications networks have changed. So uh, it's just we have to – we're all catching up. Yeah, now you can actually record a lot of uh, – from a, like a home studio a lot of people are starting to do. Mm-hmm. Well, that's where I am right now and yeah. my so that kind of happens. Uh, oh, well, we got to jump in uh, to uh, this. This is probably the coolest movie credit ever, really, for you for being just voice, you know. But uh, you were in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Yes, I was. I got to revoice the Maharaja. That's how they referred him the the kid with the turban, who's hosting the god awful dinner party that. Uh, <laughs> Is so infamous from that movie, which I never even saw when I was working on the movie. So I had no idea I was in that scene until years and years later. Because, of course, I didn't go see the movie when it came out because I didn't think I would like it. (laughs) 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 But that aside, um, yeah, so that's kind of fun. It was a... Now, it's an interesting story, too. I, I got I auditioned for the role, got cast, went to uh, a Hollywood Formosa with Warner Brothers Hollywood Studios. And I walk in, and there's the engineer, and there's me in. And I said, okay, what are we doing? Is it, Where's the director? Is Spielberg here? Is he calling in? What's going on? Is anybody? I said, what are we doing? She says, I don't know. They didn't give me any directions. Uh, I said, okay, uh, so let's put our heads together. Nobody's calling in. I guess we better just try to match his voice the best we can. For some reason, maybe they had a dirty track and needed it re-recorded. And next thing I knew, it wasn't just the lines I had auditioned for we were recording. It was all this, ah, <laughs> all 
pin sticking stuff. So, <laughs> and we were working with the black and white print back then. So, it, you know, when you see it in color, it's, <laughs> it's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> And you didn't realize you were hosting a, a feast of monkey brains? And- no, I didn't until one day I was at a department store and I heard my voice coming out of a TV set. And I looked over and I, oh, that, I haven't seen this. Um, well, we, we, there were no DVDs even back then, okay? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's it was like a VHS different and- world. <laughs> and then, then I, I finished my speech and the camera pans across the table. I was, oh, I'm in that scene that everybody's talking about. <laughs> oh, yucky. Okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Well, we'll hop along here. There's some other things that people will probably recognize you from. It looks like you did a, a bit of work on pound puppies. I did. I did a, a several of those. I think miscellaneous puppies. And those were stars, too. They had some of the stars from Laughing. Ruth Buzzy was in that show. Um you probably don't know who she was, but for me, Carol, um, um, Carol, oh, what's her name? Uh, who did the Ursula's voice? <clears throat> Pat O'Carroll or oh, Pat Carroll? Pat yeah, Carol, yes. Pound puppies too, I think, and and uh, Henry uh, Henry Gibson, I think there was. Yeah, is interesting. That was um. I think it was Hanna Barbera. I think they're redoing it right now on the Hub. Yeah, well, the Hub Hub's, Hub's got a new Hub's Doing a lot of stuff using Canadian actors. Yeah, they've even brought back the, the My Little Pony, and it's become a phenomenon again. Oh, yeah, yeah, but they're all Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> it's surprising they haven't fixed a few A's in there, I guess, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you know how to spell Canada? C-A-N-A-D-A? C-A-N-A-D-A. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay with cornball jokes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh, and it also looks like you had a couple of recurring spots as a, as a kid named Jason on Slimer and the Real Ghostbusters. It looks like it, huh? I know I worked on it, but I can't tell you if that. Um, it's probably true. Maybe I have a script somewhere I could dig it out and yeah. see. And yeah. you can listen in the the actual the, the regular Real Ghostbusters as well. The real go. Oh, because there's wait a Slimer second. in the real, and then there was the real Ghostbusters. Oh yeah, but they're two different shows. Yeah, two different like, shows, but they were kind of the same thing. They just right. updated the title for some reason. Right. It's just like Slimer spinoff. Yeah. And uh, you frequently got to work also with Howie Mandel because you got to work on Muppet Babies and also in Bobby's World. Yeah, uh, he created Skeeter's voice for the Muppet Babies, and then I think got the brainstorm. Hey, well, I mean, it was a voice he used to do in his act, I think, and yeah. then. Created Bobby's world. When, if you may notice, Bobby and Skeeter sound an awful lot alike. <laughs> Just like Gizmo, even. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, you know, if you got it, just make the most of it. So, sure. Yeah, so he was kind enough to let me do some voices on his show. So, speaking of Muppet Babies, we have to hop onto that, because how cool is that? I mean, you got to meet that's, Jim Henson, didn't you? That's the coolest thing in my life. Uh, I was a huge, huge Muppet fan ever since the Muppet Show. Well, Sesame Street even, just a huge Muppet fan and love the Muppet Show. And when I got to, um, I saw the director from Dungeons and Dragons at a restaurant and I asked him what it was up and he said, oh, uh, and looked at me like almost embarrassed. And he says, um, d- can you do Baby Piggy's voice? I said, I don't think so, because Piggy's a guy. I wasn't thinking, baby, sure, I could do. You're supposed to say, yes, I can do anything. For those (laughs) of you listening, you're always supposed to say yes. But I didn't. I said, I don't think so. But he says, oh, well, we're doing a show, a new cartoon called Me and Muppet Babies. And my jaw, like, dropped all the way down to my knees and inside of me. And I I was like, oh, oh, gosh, if, if I could do anything, I've always wanted to. This would be a dream coming true. He says, well, we're auditioning tomorrow, but we'll have you in on the callbacks. And my brain's thinking, like, heck, you are. And I called my agent, and I said, I want to be there tomorrow. I want to audition. I ran and found a copy of the Muppets, um, the Muppets Take Manhattan. It was the only Muppet movie I could find. Just watched it, watched it, watched it to figure out whose voice I could do. And I decided I could do Rolf. And auditioned, and I, I still was just totally blown away when they called and said, I got the part. 
And yes, Jim Henson showed up for the first session at the table read, and I was just talking about geeking out <laughs> and, and having to read a character that he does the voice for in front of him was nerve wracking and embarrassing. And every time my line would come up, I'd ask him, You read it first. I want to hear how you say it first. <laughs> And he was so gracious, the most amazing, gracious, lovely person you'd ever, ever, ever want to meet. He is so kind. And um, a few years down the road, he they were filming Labyrinth in England, and I was in Europe at the time. And he invited me to the set, and I got to watch them. It was pretty awesome. Oh, did you get to voice anybody in Labyrinth? No, I just got oh. to see the set, and I got to go to the creature shop. Oh, Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, goodness. and guess what? All the, Back then, we didn't have electronic pictures. We had film, and now that I'm not quite as naive as I was 30 years ago, I think maybe someone at the lab swiped the film because I had pictures of the set and Henson's place, and they all got – when I went to pick up my film, it wasn't there. Oh. Yeah, so that's the good thing about electronic pictures. Yeah. You don't have to hand them over to anybody. Yeah, because now they're probably on eBay somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen them. Maybe they just lost them or burned them. Or, you know, anything can happen. Those are the days when, you know, you're lucky if you got your film back. So Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then another kind of short-lived, short but sweet series, Camp Candy. You were icky. Yes, and I got to work with John Candy and a lot of the Second City people and uh I met Jess Harnell on that show. E.G. Daly worked on that show. And uh, who else? Oh, Danny Mann. I don't know if you know him, but he's terrific. And it was wonderful. John H- Candy had his own studio. And he had this, it was just a great place to go. And what a, I mean, another guy who I thought, you know, I, I was a fan of. And here I am getting to meet him and work with him. I mean, I. I don't care if I say one line. Is uh, just being around all these people makes me happy. <laughs> but I actually was going to ask you, hey, did you ever geek out when you met some of the other people? But it sounds like you did. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I always wanted to meet Tim Curry, and he used to work on um, oh that animal saving the animals uh, cartoon. Ginny McSwain directed it. <sighs> I just forgot the name of it. But anyway, we were finishing at one of the DuckTales or uh, Duck shows, and he was coming in, and I was like, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. I want to stay here. I want to see when Tim Curry shows up. I want to meet him. I have been known to hang around to try to catch people because I totally geek out. I met one day at an audition. <laughs> this is funny. Leslie Ann Warren was there. Who She may mean nothing to you, but she Ooh. played... Cinderella. Well, she was Cinderella. And, like, you know how they show The Wizard of Oz every year or they yep. used to on well, TV? Used to. Well, they used to do that with Cinderella, too. So she was Cinderella. Uh, was, was it a live action Cinderella? Yes, something? it was a live okay. action Cinderella. She played cool. Cinderella. And I saw her sitting there and I was just, oh, Cinderella. I, you know, she's 10 years older than me and I'm, you know, 40 years old at the time. But. I was just so impressed. So, yeah, but I've learned, you know, actors, actors, nobody wants to be stalked, but everyone appreciates a compliment. And every, and we all know we wouldn't be who we, you know, have, we would be nothing without fans watching our shows. So we appreciate that. And when people just ignore you because they're trying to be cool, that's okay. But it's also not wrong to say, hey, I really love your work or have something specific to compliment everybody likes a compliment well sure yeah. it's always the ones that uh, they get so well known for being the one character that they kind of get the attitude of like ah, i don't want to talk about that i was in that anymore it's all everyone ever talks about that's where you, it seems like you at that point they've lost the appreciation for that people still it's part of their 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 right. childhood or whatever their memories they have a good memory of you and even if it is all the same thing that you did 20 years ago it's like hey you know i'm glad people still remember that and still like me for that and most people do like i said if you're not like going berserk on them you know everybody's happy yeah to you hear a compliment so you know, I've learned that at first I was petrified being around all these famous people, and now I know that I can, you know, just 
they're all people and they all do the best they can and everyone likes to be appreciated. Yeah. And we really appreciate it for the next thing that's on the list, Darkwing Duck. You do? I was Hawker's voice on Darkwing Duck. Yeah, it was great. I see- yeah. Now here's Hawker talking to Rolf because I didn't forgot to give you that voice too when we were talking about <laughs> Muppet Baby. So Hawker would probably tell Rolf how many fleas he would have on him if he went out somewhere to be careful. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was fun. That was a great show. And now that I watch them, they're on DVD, some of them, maybe all of them. And I, I was watching them the other day to get a screenshot and really, really was appreciative of the scripts. They're very, very good scripts and very, uh, they're funny, but they're also, the way they depict the relationship between Darkwing and his daughter, I think, are really terrific. Yeah, with Goslin. And I always kind of wondered if, like, if you were to age the characters, like, Honker and Goslin, you know, were kind of always around together. If maybe in the teenage years, you know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> You never know. You never know. It could happen. It could. In, in our minds, it did. Okay. <laughs> but the uh, and that was, I guess, the that's the second time you got to work with Jim Cummings because Jim Cummings replaced Paul Winchell back on Gummy Bears, didn't he? Yeah, but Jim Cummings worked on Dumbo Circus. Well, he did, and that was his very first show. His very first voiceover gig he ever got was on Dumbo Circus. My goodness, and he's he's very versatile. My goodness, there's there's oh, a lot of he's time amazing. I I just said, Jimmy, you're going to be a star, and of course he is. And now he's in like every Disney movie. Uh, he repli- Of course, he, he did Tigger and Pooh. He does both those now. Ray the Firefly. Oh, just everything. Yeah. And Darkwing Duck. He was it was hysterical. Dan Castellaneta worked on Darkwing Duck a lot too. Who he plays Homer Simpson. Was he Launchpad? No, that was Terry McGovern. He oh. played Mega Duck, I think, or one of the, a bad duck. He was ah, oh, his <laughs> voice is similar, so that's why I thought Launchpad at first because I thought would have no. made sense, but I guess not. Okay. Mm-mm. Oh my goodness! And then uh, let's see, moving right along here, uh, you came back and they did a, a resurgence of a, a new Dennis the Menace cartoon in the '90s, and you got to be Joey and Gina. Yeah, that's kind of nice. You know, they do. It was pre- kind of a rule of thumb when I started voice in animation that they wanted you to be able to do at least two voices, if not three, because you got paid the same for up to three voices. Hmm. So they're saving money. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's how that works. Yeah. And then bringing back another old classic cartoon, you were the voice of Richie Rich. I was. That's a very lovely dress you're wearing today, Mother. Yes, he uh, was very proper. A little bit like Dumbo's voice, but ten years later. So, <laughs> ten years later, and very wealthy. <laughs> Not a co- yes. So that was fun. I played. A, you can see a clip of that on my website, voiceofyourchildhood.com. dot com. Um, and it's there's a clip of a scene from Richie Rich, and actually, I'm all the voices. I'm him and the two girls who are talking too. Yeah, they only have you listed as Richie Rich and Irona. You probably well, a lot more than that, weren't you? Probably, but who knows what their names are? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of a shame because uh, it's like I kind of completely missed out because I used to watch the older Richie Rich, you know, when I was a kid. And I completely oh. missed out on the resurgence of it. Well, that was a deke one. You were probably busy going to college or something. Uh, 1996. Uh, well, yeah, I was trying to. Uh, come here, college. <laughs> That's college. That yeah, that works. Yeah. Oh, but then okay. Now here's going to be what's a, what's a big one for a, a lot of people. I have never actually played this game, but you did some voices for Grim Fandango for Lucas Arts. I did, and that was absolutely thrilling. Um, that because video games were new, and and that and that had such an incredible artwork in it. Uh, I really enjoyed that, and and. And then I think that was when video games just started changing and being more three-dimensional. Yeah, 3D graphics, getting more voice work that actually didn't sound like a computer was talking. (laughs) Right. So, you know, to be – I feel like that's kind of neat that I got to work on that for – especially, you know, Lucas. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and now it's about to be re-released for the PS4. 
Uh, it's coming, I think, in September, October. They're about to re-release a, a an enhanced. Version. I want to see that. I would love to see that. That would be fun. Kind of wonder if they're going to have you have to revoice or re-record any of the voices, or if they still have the original recordings and they're going to bring them back. You better call them and let them know who my agent is in case they need me. Yes. <laughs> Katie got yeah. to get paid. People, come on! <laughs> so who, who does it? Do, do you know who's doing it? Is it just Lucas Arts? You just call Lucas Arts? Uh, I, all I know is that, that they're doing it, and I think what they're doing is they're just enhancing the graphics a bit. I don't know if they're going to try to redub the voices. It's it's supposed to be the same game, kind of like what they did with uh, the Ducktales game. Uh, they've actually redone the graphics and everything, and actually had. Um, uh, Oh, and you even mentioned her name, who was Magic of Dispel, and then uh, the, um, I forgot his name also, who was uh, Scrooge McDuck. They actually came in and recorded voices for for the game, and they've just re-enhanced the graphics and everything for DuckTales. So I guess they're kind of giving the same treatment now with Grim Fandango. Oh, wow. But no, I, I complete, and you even just said her name, She because she was Rocky on Rocky and Oh, Jude and, Frey. Yes, because she was Magic of Dispel. And then you've also even worked with uh, with Scrooge McDuck. Um because he was on Adventures in Odyssey for a, a while there. And yes. My brain just yes. went out the window. Uh, well, Alan Young. Alan Young, yes, who, I knew that. Well, I grew up watching on the Mr. Ed show as a kid, so I watched him every week. And to have to be friends with him and Janet Waldo, who is Judy Jetson, she also works on Odyssey. She worked on Pandemonium with me, which was the first animated series I had a regular role on. Um, those, All those people, famous Genius, wonderful people. Do you learn anything from them when you work with them? Oh, of course. I learn stories. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody likes to tell stories. Um, yes, of course. You know, that's how we, the best way to learn is by doing. Um, and just to, you know, well, Janet, you know, her enthusiasm, the way she reads. Yeah, we always pick up, and you know, there's nothing new under the sun, so every voice is an imitation of somebody else's, you know, <laughs> just sort of uh, um, molded and changed, tweaked to fit the situation. But, we'll, you know, you look at a part and oh, that reminds me of this character. Okay, I'm going to do something like that, you know. Which makes me wonder, did, is it from anybody you've worked with that you picked up the habit? I've heard you don't like to read a script beforehand because you like to be surprised. <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I, I've been, I thought about why, why that is. And I, that's because back in the day, very rarely did we see our scripts ahead of time because they would have to FedEx them. Wow. Uh, yeah, Gummy Bears would FedEx our scripts. Um, I don't know if Muppet Babies did. We get, you know, an envelope on the porch and there was our script. Now, but, but not that often. So we learned, those of us who are my age, that, you know, you go to the studio, you get your script, you look at it, and that's good enough. So I think it just, it's a, just a habit, not thinking that it's necessary instead of thinking, wow, this is a great opportunity to look at your script ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, moving to the next thing that's listed on here, Totally Spies completely missed me on my area because I was kind of older and it looked like it was aimed for the girls to kind of be an action series for girls, right? Pretty much? Uh, yeah, but a lot of boys liked it. It kind of – it actually drew in boys and girls because there were girls – it was kind of like Charlie's Angels meets Clueless. And, but they had all these really cool gadgets. As a matter of fact, Jess, Har Jess Harnell played Jerry the first two seasons, like I played Alex the first two seasons before they recast with Canadian actors. Hmm, um, Canadians must work a little cheaper or something. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. Um, at any rate, so there, but they had all these really cool gadgets. So a lot of guys, kids I know, boys enjoyed the show because they like to see their – how this turned into that, you know, how they used – had these tools, sort of like James Bond-type tools in the show. Yeah. And you guys were before Kim Possible. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm I pretty sure we you were. were. Kim Possible I came we along. Were. Yeah. A so, years you know, like I said, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Yeah, pretty much. Everybody's done it in some version before. Heck, even uh, uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2 had a couple elements from The Lion King that I, that, that I kind of noted that uh, actually worked very well, though, for, for the story. Uh-huh. Very well, good movie, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because you you uh, you do movie reviews, right? Yes, I do. If I if I think they fit in with the show, at least there are a lot that I skip. Uh huh. And then sometimes I just don't have money. I I was going to review Edge of Tomorrow, but I just I didn't have the money for the week when it came out, and now I'm just don't know when I'm going to get to it because I got to I got to review Transformers. I think next. Oh boy! Or yeah, Jess Hardell's in Transformers. He's he does some of the tra- Transformer voice. He's one of those guys. And in case anybody's wondering, when she keeps mentioning, mentioning Jess Harnell, think let's see, uh, Wacko, uh, and uh, if you ever watched America's Funny Some Videos, whenever Tom Bergeron would say, "Tell him about it, Jess." There's Jess Harnell there. I mean, that guy is everywhere. Yeah, he's amazing, and he's really, really nice, and just the nicest person you'd ever want to meet. He also is in a rock band called Rock Sugar, um, and yeah, he's everywhere because he's great, and yeah. he does amazing. Well, he does um, impersonations too, so he's really <laughs> well known for his impersonations. He can, you know, uh, many, many, many different impersonations. Yeah. He's the one guy I know of that impersonates the Beatles, but not as the Beatles, but each individual Beatle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's got a really good ear. And, of course, he was uh, wacko mm-hmm. Warner, so that's sort of a, a, a John Lennon-ish voice, right? Yeah, it kind of is. John Lennon with potty emergencies. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see, and we'll just kind of move along in here. Oh, the Mr. Men show, when they brought that back around, I was so happy because I used to collect, Mis- uh, you know, I well, I used to read them all from the library, but I only actually had Mr. Bounce. But you got to be some of the, the little misses, and uh, I think you were a couple of, of the Mr. Men, or were you just some of the little misses? Oh, no, just little misses. I was little Miss Chatterbox. And you know, obviously, she talks all the time because she's always thinking about all kinds of different things, all kinds of different things at the same time. So they just come out of her mouth as soon as she thinks about it. Uh, oh, look over there! Hmm. Uh, so and then, uh, um, little Miss Helpful, who just you know, she tries to be helpful. Uh, she's not always. And little Miss Daredevil, who's just um, you know, like uh, oh goodness, what's that guy's name who used to Evil Can Evil? <laughs> no, the guy who. Like sort of a parody of Evil Knievel. Remember that other guy, Super Dave. Dave? Super Dave. She's kind of like a little little Miss Super Dave. Hold on to your patootie. She's got rocket <laughs> boots. Yeah. Uh, oh, I used to. That came on like really early on Saturday mornings when they brought that back. But I'd get up and watch it, man. Really? Uh, well, thank you for doing that. <laughs> just because, like, I remember I used to read those books all the time, and so it was just fun. It was it was definitely aimed for under my age level at the the age I was at that time. But I I liked it. So, oh, I think I found the, the the show you were trying to reference before with Tim Curry had popped up on. Was it Animalia? No, I was in Animalia. Okay, I thought maybe he you was know, on it with you. He was in the family, the the something. They had a name, and they were going in the jungle. It was an like ecology. Oh, um, was, I think I know what you're talking about. Wasn't it like a Nickelodeon show? Uh, the yeah. Wild Thornberries, maybe. Yes, yeah, the Wild Thornberries. Exactly. I didn't watch that one. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah, he was in Wild Thornberry. Well, at least we managed to get that put together and got it, you know, figured out. So okay. IMDb, I'm noticing, has locked in my alternative names that I never used. So <laughs> if this section is awaiting migration to a new system and its submissions are on hold, okay, well, I can't even submit anything, so what's the point? Yeah, well, I guess check back some other time. Maybe you'll get it. Uh, oh, but okay, now this is cool. Because okay. after being in a Harrison Ford movie, you kind of got to be Harrison Ford. I did. I did. I got to be Han Solo as a, as a boy in the Padawan Minutes, the Lego Star Wars special. So, yes, yeah, some people I had worked with on Animalia uh, were doing this gig, and, and the director, bless his heart, I didn't even audition for it, just called my agent said, we want Katie to work on something, and they sent me the script. Now, this one I read. Because I didn't know, I was curious to just get a job out of the blue is a wonderful thing. And I wanted to know who, who it was from. So I'm reading it. Oh, they said, you're playing Ian. So I'm reading, reading, reading. And then at the end, he says, but my name's not Ian. It's Han. Han Solo. <laughs> Which is awesome. I, I was like, oh, wow, this is so great. So, <laughs> you know, 
a lot of people don't know me, don't know my work, whatever. I do little bits of things here and there, but there, some of the things I've gotten to do are just absolutely precious and exciting for me. Yeah, you're now part of the Star Wars universe. Yeah! Right? So I should go to Star Wars conventions. Yes. You know, that actually would be kind of cool when they do Star Wars weekends down in, uh, in, a, in Disney World in the Hollywood Studios. That would be actually pretty awesome. Yeah, well, one of these days. I hope so. That would be pretty cool. Because they do get a lot of the voices from the Clone Wars and uh, from the upcoming Star Wars Rebels. Maybe they somebody do. ought to call you in on that because, hey, they're doing early Star Wars Rebels. They need a young Han Solo to show up. Oh, that well. That would be cool. See what you can find. Let me know about it because, uh, I, you know, I don't know. They, uh, the world is so big and yeah. uh, and different. so many different producers are com- doing stuff, so it's hard to know everybody. But I would certainly love to, at least to be consistent, although that was kind of a parody, uh, you know. Yeah. That was just one episode, <laughs> but it was very funny. So, but yeah, anyway, find, out, find out who's doing it. Han Solo, that would be really cool just to, for at least one episode. They ought to just come and find you if they ever need to it's do it. It's called Star Wars Rebels. Star Wars Rebels, yeah. It's supposed to premiere, I think, this coming September. Oh, then they've already recorded it. Yeah, they've already recorded but I don't, you know, if, I figure this is going to last more than one season. They'll probably well, keep this going to at least There's lots movie. of merch, I see, online. A lot of course, of, it's Star Wars. But I but, wonder who's producing it. Yeah, somebody ought to just bug them and say... Lucasfilm, it's produced by Lucasfilm. Yeah, somebody ought to bug them and say, hey, we want to see a young Han Solo show up. Wait, Lucas and Lucas did Grim Fandango, so I better just make a note to get a hold of these Lucasfilm people somehow. There you go. And just kind of... Two things to talk to them about, right? Yeah, and say, hey, you know, fans want to see Han Solo maybe make an appearance in this series here. Ha, 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 ha. It's might. Yeah, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Okay. (laughs) Say no more, say no more. Yeah, I'll have to ask ask my agent to... Yeah. Come up. Mm-hmm. And then if that ever happens, I can be like, yes, I was there when we thought of this. That's right. So. That's right. It's that Jeremy guy. It's yeah. all the- – yeah. Okay. And I see currently you're working on something called Space Racers. Well, we, we finished it. It premiered in May. It's on PBS. It's uh, consulted by NASA. It teaches kids about – it's about space shuttles, but they are um, – it's, it's a neat show. Uh, long history. We've been working on it for years, so it just got on the air on PBS. So that's it's really cool. I just do some miscellaneous characters. I'm a Land Rover. Oh, I'm this little boy named Robin. He's like a little Cub Scout shuttle. Uh, and no, he's not named Robin. What's his name? Scout. Crow? Scout. No. Okay, because there's a Crow, Sojourner, and Sandpiper. They got you listed as. Oh, Crow. Sandpiper, yeah. Well, maybe it's crow, <laughs> but I thought it was scout. <laughs> I'll have to look and see. Uh, now you got me wondering, crow, huh? Maybe yeah, that's what it says Some... at least on IMDb. <laughs> oh well, let's see. But we already tested that and found that was a little. Oh, wonky. okay. Attach sojourners. Let's see. I was sojourner, crow, sandpiper, and questy. It says the direct. I I see an email here from the director. Uh, so I think I was all those. You're getting uh, so busy, you can't even keep track. <laughs> well, you know what? It's not. It's kind of like you know when you first start out, it's just so exciting, and it is always exciting. But you kind of learn. You know, you audition for stuff. You don't know if you're going to get it. And then you work on a show, and it doesn't come on the air for three years. And so you just, like, always are looking forward to the next thing. You know, you just, you know, some things, you know, if you do them more than one year, you'll remember who they are. But if it's just, you know, one season or I don't know. And if it's been 30 years, you might forget. (laughs) And you spent, like, what, the last 20 years actually doing a radio show that actually, some people listening might remember or might know of. Well, that's one of the biggest blessings of my life. It's Adventures in Odyssey, and we are actually in our 26th year of recording that show. And it's been it's on the air all over the world. It's uh, I play Connie Kendall, and it's such a joy to be part of a, a show that touches and blesses so many people. And I think I've heard probably maybe every episode of that, almost. There's really? probably a few I've missed. <laughs> well, we've d- I haven't, so you're ahead of me. Uh, <laughs> but we, we're at about 750 episodes, I think. 
Whew, that's a lot. But a lot of them I've checked out of the libraries, and I, cause that's what got me into radio dramas. I would listen to Adventures in Odyssey while I was working and, and things like that. And then I, I kind of was like, well, if I like this sort of a format, I wonder what it was like back in the old days with just radio stories all the time. So I started listening to uh, old Red Skelton and George Burns and old mm. stuff. And to see how things have kind of progressed and to know that that type of entertainment is still being made is really cool. Yeah, and we have the highest production quality on our show. Uh, I'm so very, very proud of it and the people who work so hard to put it out. They even do a, a something called – it's through Focus on the Family, and they have something called Radio Theater, and they record those scripts in England. They just won an Audi Award for their Oliver Twist this year. Ooh, so if you want to hear a lot of classic stuff, they've done Screw Tape Letters, Oliver Twist. They did um, – Squanto, Summer Histories of Chronicles people. of Narnia. I have that set. That's an excellent, excellent version. Well, they're all amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. It's, it cost me a lot of money to buy that set, but it was worth uh, it. <laughs> well, I'll tell Paul McCusker that you said, and the, the producer, Dave Arnold. Cause. Yeah, because I think the, the radio drama versions they did are a lot better even than the movies. And the movies have been pretty good, but it just it seemed that just didn't capture the feel of, like, the Narnia books on the well, movies. Well, obviously, you've got, like, your three media. You've books. You know, if you read a book, a movie can never – it's not the same experience as a book. Radio drama can get away with more – it's like a book in a way because there's stuff you don't have to see it. You can just if you can talk about it well enough and and, and bring it to life. It's your imagination. It's so it, it's actually a little more personal experience when you're listening to something. I think, and that's yeah. what I appreciate about the medium. So I'm a huge radio person. It's you know it's more about listening than seeing, and I guess that's why you know like I said I don't I don't. I hope I don't seem arrogant. You know, I I enjoy the process of working. I love working with the other actors. I love creating characters. It's fun to see it when it's done, but I don't know if it's more fun to see it than it was doing it. Yeah, because that theater of the mind aspect. Yeah, listening. You know, listening to Odyssey is great because I'm not always in every scene, so I want to hear what's happened, and I can hear the other actors, and um, you know. I like to hear it, to hear the whole story. Um, anyway, yeah. I love listening. I love a lot of stuff I listen to on the radio, and I don't. I watch very, very little television, uh, yeah. <laughs> believe now, it or not. You've actually moved uh, on to directing. You're doing uh, Rex Tanner? Is that what yes, called? I got to direct. There's a company called Audible Scripts in Louisiana, and Will Lewis, who's the – he and his brother founded this company, and they thought if – if people like to listen to audio um, books, maybe they would like to hear screenplays being read out loud. You know, movies that haven't been produced yet or may never be produced. But uh, so he came, he optioned a script that was an a actually an animated uh, feature length film script. And he asked me if I wanted to direct it because he said, I don't know anything about animation. Would you like to direct this? And I thought that would be wonderful. So I got to hire a bunch of people I knew uh, were kind enough, really. Uh, hire, I'll use the, word, <laughs> the term hire loosely. And they you know, all provided great character voices for this. And it's, uh, you can find it at Rex Tanner. It's called Rex Tanner and the Sword of Damocles. It's supposed to be out at the end of the month, and people can download it, I think, for a very reasonable fee to listen to the screenplay. And hopefully, if it's successful, Olafemi Shoamimo, who wrote the script, um, he also has like five other screenplays in the Rex Tanner series. So if this goes well, maybe we'll get to record some of the rest of them for our listening pleasure. So, And this will be available on, on iTunes? iTunes, Amazon, Audible. You can go. We have a Facebook page. I know Rex Tanner, the uh, Rex Tanner Adventures. I think, and maybe you can put post a link. And yeah, I, I think I put a link to RexTanner dot com. Yeah, and then you can you can hear the trailer. Maybe you'll play it on this show when you edit this together. Cause Certainly, I will. We had loads of fun, uh, and my dear friends who put up with me, because I really do like directing, and I really am, um, I, I love listening and picking up on things, so sometimes I can be kind of demanding, because I want to hear 
something a certain way. And, and when I, I love to try to get performances out of people and just make them as fun as they can be. So they're very patient because, you know, I heard the trailer and I made the editor, I think, edit it about 15 times until it was how I wanted to <laughs> <laughs> I hope people like it, and if they don't, that might be my last directing gig, but... In 1935, race car driver Rex Tanna is recruited by the U.S. government for a secret mission. Travel to the Olympics in Berlin and find out who is draining American athletes of their muscle, leaving them shriveled up and weak. We have need of you and that remarkable device of yours. The Omnidial, a mysterious device permanently grafted to Rex's skin, which imbues him with temporary superpowers... When it works. Ah, nuts. Rex is accompanied by the beautiful but chaste Dr. Penelope Mulgrew. Judging from your level of class and distinction, I expect you'll tie the pants in a knot around your head. Rex's trusty sidekick Mick can't help but notice... I think maybe you care more for this woman than you want to admit. They arrive in Berlin to attend a state dinner as Mr. and Mrs. Rich, where they run into the agent MI6 as assigned to the case, Rex's older brother, Alexander. Aren't you going to introduce me to your date, Rex? A better sibling rivalry has developed the brothers since childhood, but they managed to put aside their differences for the sake of the mission. If I gotta do it with you helping, I guess that's the way it's gotta be, dingbat. As our heroes travel by plane in pursuit of their only lead, Rex makes a sickening discovery about his brother. We've been expecting you. Can Rex save Penelope from his brother? And can he stop the Sword of Damocles before it's too late? Rex Tanner and the Sword of Damocles by Olufemi S. Showamemo, directed by Katie Lee, a presentation of AudibleScripts.com. Anyway. Well, at least you got to try something <laughs> once. Oh, yeah. I really enjoyed it. I like, I, I do coaching, too, because um, I, I, I do like helping people, you know, understand what's involved. I think it might have been you uh, pre-interview uh, uh, talking about the physicality of animation. And you can't punch and kick and jump up and down with just your voice. It requires your whole body moving to create those sounds. And, you know, I, I just want people to do that. So teach them how to do that so they can do their best. And I would say that would be good advice for anybody you're, who's interested in maybe getting into voice acting. That would be just a good thing to remember. Or is there anything else you would advise somebody who was looking to get into it? You know, there's so many different ways of getting into voiceover these days, and there's so many different ways of using your voice. Um, there's lots and lots of free information on the Internet, classes, workshops, things you can just watch and learn from. Uh, these days, most people need a home studio, um, especially if you don't live in L.A., um, but you can work um, and, and read out loud. Really, the best thing is to just keep, you know, read out loud. Read If you're interested in animation, just read to kids. Read kids' books out loud. Create, you know, come up with the different character voices. Just like you read to kids is kind of the same way we come up with character voices when we're auditioning for an animated show. Yeah, very good advice. Okay. Thank you. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap this up here. But uh, so, thank you for coming on to our show this week. This has been awesome. Well, it was wonderful getting to know you and and finding out about your podcast. I think it's terrific. Thanks for having me. And everybody can find you at Katie Lee L E I G H dot com or the Voice of Your Childhood dot com. If I got that right. It's just voiceofyourchildhood.com. All right. And I will be posting links on today's show notes and probably will go ahead and add you to the what we call Friends of Neverland. I have a whole section in there so we can get a good permalink for you. I'll also make sure I post links to rextainer.com. And uh, I, you do have links probably to the Facebook page from the main page here, right? Uh Oh, no, I don't see one. So I'll just make sure I put a link for the Facebook page then as well on the website, NeverlandPodcast.com. And if anybody wants to get a hold of me, do not forget podcast at NeverlandPodcast.com where you can send me your comments, any any memories of your childhood or favorite show that I haven't covered yet, feel free to send them. Also find us on Facebook, Facebook.com slash NeverlandPodcast. And on Twitter, Neverland P, the letter P, Neverland P cast is where you can send us a Twitter and follow us to, to find out what's going on on Neverland and any news bullets that I find throughout the week. And as we always like to say on on, uh, on the end of our every show of Neverland, and everybody seems to enjoy this, and you can remember this yourself there, Katie, okay. remember to keep your pixie in your pocket. That way, whenever you need to, you can pull her out and sprinkle a little bit of pixie dust and spread the love, spread the joy to you and everybody around you. Oh, 
Oh, I will keep that in mind forever. It's very good advice. It's all about keeping the right attitude, and that's what we would like to have here at Neverland. Amen. All righty. All right. Well, we'll see everybody next week, and maybe we'll find another time to have Katie on again if anybody wants to say, hey, I wanted to ask her about this, and you didn't ask her. So, <laughs> I'd be happy to. Okay. All right. So goodbye, Neverlanders. Bye. Bye.